I've been going coming to CBC since 2011. I've been going here for about a year now. My first Sunday was Pastor Andrew's Sunday. The thing I like about it is I like how everybody is accepting no matter what you look like or it doesn't you know it's it's on the inside is what matters here i mean it it makes it just feels it feels right special cbc is definitely a church that is passionate about reaching their hands into the community and we are constantly looking for ways to be involved in other people's lives i know i'm really glad i am a member and like i said i don't plan on changing anything for me worship has always been the thing that got me the closest to god music connects with me in a very spiritual, very deep way. And so being a part of the worship team is great because not only do I get to worship God, but I get to lead other people into worshiping God and I get to watch them do it. And I think that's just a fabulous, fabulous opportunity. My name is Andrew, and I'm one of the pastors on staff here at CBC. We're glad you guys are here this morning. For those of you who are joining us online this morning, we want to welcome you as well. If you've never taken an opportunity to come and visit us here at our Blair campus, we would love to invite you to come out and be a part of our family and experience for yourself firsthand what God is doing in the life and the ministry here. And we're going to do that some today, and I'll explain here in just a moment. As you came in, one of two things happened. Either you noticed a card like this in your seat, you picked it up, and you're curious about it, or you're sitting on it right now. I would encourage you to pick it up. We are kicking off a brand new series next week that we're calling The Power of One. In a society that's inundated with the idea that bigger is better and more means more success, we're going to share four stories in Scripture, four compelling movements of God that all began with the number one. And I could not be more excited about The Power of One series and I also could not be more inclined to encourage you to invite somebody to come with you. So please, don't just take this card and use it as a reminder that you place on your refrigerator. Let your wife do that for you. I would encourage all of you to take a card, if not the one in front of you. We got a collection of them in the back as well. And you can take these cards and use them as invitations to personally invite somebody to join you and be a part of our family next week as we kick off a brand new series that we're calling The Power of One. This is a time in our series or in our sermon or in our message as we gather, that I would encourage you to pull out your Bibles and open to Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. But today we're going to do a little bit different. The primary text throughout this last series entitled At My Church that we've been in is Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47, which is really truly the introduction and the establishment of the early church. It was the catalyst for this series. Today, we're not going to ask you to pull out your Bibles because, not because we're doing out with Bibles or doing away with the Bibles, but because I believe that what you're going to hear is a living embodiment of the Word of God. Every week I talk about how the more that we dive into the Word of God, the Word of God becomes active and alive in us and it's still being written in our hearts today. I also believe that we have an obligation and an awesome privilege to live out the Word of God in our lives. And so today you're going to hear testimonies. You're going to hear stories. You're going to hear experiences as a family of how we're seeing the Word of God lived out in our relationships, how we're seeing the Word of God move in our community and beyond. And so seven weeks ago today, we started an At My Church series as we as a staff and leadership team wrestled for weeks and weeks and weeks about who we are, what we're doing, where we're going, and what matters most. And we talked over and over and over again about a mission and a vision and, and who we are as a church and what that means for us all. And what we quickly realized as we fasted and as we prayed and as we studied God's word together was that we didn't need to reinvent the wheel. We didn't need to come up with a fancy mission statement or a compelling vision statement because Jesus had taken all the guesswork out as the church for our mission and our vision. In Matthew 22, Jesus says, look, you got to love God with every fiber of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. That's our mission. That's collective mission. That's the collective mission of the church. And then as you look at the, the capital seats, the plural church, we looked at our vision and said, well, what's the vision of the church then? The vision of every church has to be Matthew 28, where we go make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and raising up fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So then we began to ask the question amongst our staff and our leaders, if Jesus has given us our mission and our vision as a church and it's collective, then what makes us unique? And that's something that we were 
uh, excited to wrestle with because from the establishment of the early church, you don't have to look any further than the epistles or the, the letters written to the early churches that were establishing themselves to find out that though they had a common mission and a common vision that was a, a parallel across all of them, that they each had their own unique footprint, their own context, their own culture, and their own uh, identity. So then we ask the question, what's our identity? What makes us unique? If we all have the same mission and vision, love God with every fiber of our being, love our neighbor ourselves, and go make disciples and raise up fully devoted followers of Jesus, then what, what makes us unique? And what we all came to as we went away on a staff retreat and a leadership retreat and praying and fasting is that the Lord unified our hearts around the common existence. And week one, we talked about that, that we exist as a church to be a community where people encounter Jesus and their lives are changed forever. And through the story of a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, we saw an encounter where this woman meets Jesus and comes into a right relationship with him and everything about her life is changed forever. It compels her to live her life in a brand new way. And we said, that's it. Lord, we want to be that community. We want to be that kind of community where people can come and they can encounter you and their lives will be changed forever. So then we began to explore our core values as a church. And I want to let you know that there are a lot of things that as a staff, as a leadership team, and as volunteers that we value here. A lot of things that make up our DNA. But we were able to boil it down to four key areas, four what we call our core four. Four core values that that help drive the identity, the existence of who we are as a church. That if we're going to be a community where people encounter Jesus and their lives are changed forever, these are the four things that embody that. The first that we looked at during our second week in our series was that of gather. That at my church, we gather. And we looked at why we gather. That we gather for three reasons. We gather to encourage one another. We gather to exalt the name of Jesus together. And we gather to equip each other to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. Regardless of the gathering, whether you're here at our celebration services on Sunday morning, any one of our three services or our online community, or you're a part of our midweek programs, our adult education, whatever it is in our youth ministry, our kids ministry, across the board, one of the first four of our core four is that at my church, we're committed to gathering. The third week, we looked at the second of our core values, and that is the core value of grow. That at my church, we're committed to grow. We grow in our knowledge. We grow in our understanding of God's word. We grow in our relationship with God. We grow in our commitment to the community. We grow in our relationships to one another. That at our church, we are committed to being a community that is committed to growing and doing that in a variety of ways. And so we try to take the guesswork out of it every week for you to know how you can get involved in community and grow. And then the the fourth week, we looked at our third core, four, and that is that we at my church are committed to giving. And church, not only giving, but we want to be known for our radical generosity. We want to be known for a church that that takes God at his word, for his word, and lives out what it means to be generous. And we identified three really practical ways that we are called to give, not only through scripture, but that we can give. Here's a body, and that is that we want to give with our time, we want to give with our talents, and we want to give with our treasure. We want to give of ourselves. And then the fifth week, we looked at our fourth core value, and that was that at my church, we're committed to going. And we talked about the master of the ceremony that goes, and he says, I want you to invite the socialites. And the servant goes out, and he extends these invitations, and he gets three really lame excuses about why they can't come to the table to the celebration. And this servant comes back to the master of the ceremony and says, look, master, these guys have all said these things. And the master gets furious, and he says, look, go out to the marginalized the misrepresented, the mistreated, and the misplaced, and you invite them in. You tell them what's going on here, and you invite them into the party. And so the servant does that, and people start coming in in droves, and the servant then begins to count heads, and he looks around, and he says, Master, I've done what you said. I've invited all all the least of these, and there's still room at the table. And the master of the ceremony with urgency says, Then you go to the alleys, to the dirt roads, And you check underneath the hedges, lift up the low-hanging branches, and you find everybody you can find, and you invite them to the table. Because as long as there's still room here at the table, we have an obligation and an awesome opportunity to invite people to encounter Jesus. And their life will never be the same again. And then last week, we kind of finished up our core four 
or the culmination, a message that I entitled Movement Over Monument. How at my church, we want to be a movement of God rather than building monuments for the godly. If you've missed any one of these messages along the way, I want to let you know, be encouraged. You can go back online, countrybible.org, click our media page, and right there, we'll have a link to all of the sermons that we give here at this church, and you can go back and get caught up, because this matters. As a family, this matters. We've got to get this. We've got to know who we are, what we believe, what we're about, and where we're going. And so today, guys, as we, as we kind of wrap up this At My Church series, I could not think of a better way to do that than to invite some of the men and women of our leadership team and our staff who are in the trenches every day, who are realizing our existence being fulfilled and fruit of our core values. So you get to kind of sit in on a family conversation that would typically take place on a Tuesday during our staff development time. Every Tuesday, I gather with our staff and our leadership team from 12 to 1.30, and I ask this question. I say, guys, recently, this week, where have you seen realized why we exist as a church? Where are you seeing fruit in our four core values, in our core four? And what we do is then we go around and everybody gets to participate as a family and share life experiences, things that numbers and barometers and measurements could never, ever really tell. Real stories of men and women like you in community right where you're at. Some of you even sitting here this morning that have encountered Jesus and your life has been changed forever. So this morning, we want to do that together. We want to celebrate together. So let me just ask, as we start off, where have you guys recently realized our existence being lived out? Well, I'd love to start by just letting you know, my name is Mark Zanotto. I'm the executive pastor of the church. And I've been here about five years as an attender and member and only started my job July 1st this year. And as I reflected on what we wanted to talk about today, the Lord brought two words to my mind. The, the first one was volunteerism, and the second one was community. And to me, that completely embodies what I have been blessed by seeing um, these last few months uh, just in the role of executive pastor. You know, it's probably not lost on you that my job is to really manage the affairs of the church on a day-to-day -day basis and to help administer and, and, and move things along as we do. And, and one of the important things about that is we are blessed as a body, as a church body, to have this facility, to have these grounds and this building. As uh, Andrew said, we don't want to be a monument. We don't want to be known for the building, but this building is a tool. And it is a tool that we use to reach out into the community and welcome individuals here. Welcome them, whether it be the comedy event that we had just last week, uh, where a number of new faces from the community were invited by members of this church to attend, or a Sunday morning service like this, where, again, we invite individuals from our community to come and share with us as a family. And so what's important is, is that we need to maintain what the Lord has blessed us with. We need to be good stewards of this facility. And it's probably not lost on you if you've noticed there's been paint going up on the walls. There's been a transformation happening in the lobby. There's been, you know, changes here in this room to, to better utilize the space, to better utilize uh, it for ministry and how we do uh, the work that we do, the work that the Lord has called us to do as a church where the volunteerism and the community come in is that there is a countless number of individuals who have given of themselves time, talent, and treasures to make it happen. Every time we make a call, whether it be to put paint on the walls or to do some kind of change uh, within the physical structure, just in maintenance and upkeep, um, we are overwhelmed by the number of people that respond. Many of you are in this room, and, and I, I know that, and I've talked to a number of you. You don't want accolades for that. You don't want, you know, you're very humble about what it is that you do, but I cannot thank you enough. We cannot thank you enough. This church cannot thank you enough if you're one of those individuals who uh, just repeatedly is, is there to answer the call uh, to, to serve this church in that way. 
uh, we are blessed, and, and it is amazing. And in that involvement, in that, that sharing of uh, our time, treasures, and talents to maintain this facility, the community happens. Uh, just laughter and enjoyment of each other's time and presence. It's, it's overwhelming, like I said, and, and I cannot thank you enough. Yeah, Mark, one of the things that we really take serious here at our church is being a good steward of what God has given us. It's important that we know as a, as a, as a church that we're debt-free. As a community, we don't owe anything on our building. We don't owe anything on our grounds. And not only that, but I want to celebrate the generosity of, of many of you here that have helped us realize uh, a lot of this retrofitting of our building. Did you know that not one penny from our general budget has left the general budget to do any renovations to the building. Literally 100% of everything that you're seeing in our restrooms that are being completely retrofitted in this worship center where you're seeing the stage and, and, and what you're seeing on the, on the walls and throughout, 100% of it has been donated because of the generous contributions and the commitment of, of people in our church that, that want to see the, the existence of our church realized, where people can come in in a comfortable environment where they, they feel like they're a part of our family and they can encounter Jesus and their lives are changed forever. Mark, we also have seen a tremendous turnaround in our volunteers, and I know we'll hear more about that in a minute. But if somebody were out here this morning that has been looking to get involved in the life of the church and they have some time to give, they've got some talents and, and some treasures, how would you encourage them to get involved? How, how, how could they help out? It's really simple. I would just encourage you either to stop me or Terry Hodson. Uh, Terry's our office manager, administrator, she's literally my hands and feet. She helps me manage the project load that we have every week here. I, I couldn't do it without her. Please approach one of the two of us, call into the church, ask for us. Uh, we'd be more than happy to meet with you, talk about what it is that you're, you're interested in, how you're interested in helping out, and get you connected. So That's great. Thanks, Mark. Who else would like to share about where we're seeing our existence realized and our core four lived out? Alex. Uh, Again, my name is Alex. I'm the, the worship pastor here at CBC. And I just wanted to share, uh, just share a, a, quick, uh, a quick story of someone hearing the call uh, that God put on their life to serve and answering that call. Um, again, we've been talking about our core four and one of those being giving uh, through your time, your talent, and your treasures. And because I'm a part of the, the worship team, I get to serve uh, with lots of people who have just a high, high level of talent that are able to give their time and their talent to serve God uh, through worship, which has a huge benefit on our church as a whole. Uh, so from time to time, I get uh, people who are interested in, in uh, the worship team. And uh, a number of weeks ago, a woman named Mary says to me that she was interested in playing um, piano, playing keyboard on, on our worship team. And I said, that would be awesome. Let's, uh, let's see if that's a good fit. So I kind of followed the usual um, protocol that I would. And I, I sent uh, sent her an email with a couple songs to, to practice and learn at home. And we set up a time where we would uh, meet on the stage here and go through those songs. And, um, you know, that time came. We met here. We played through the two songs. She played through them almost perfectly. It went really well. And uh, just kind of casually after we were, we were done, um, you know, I said, remind me again how long um, you've been playing the keyboard, how long you've been playing piano. Um, and she said, um, just under a year. And so she had been, and I said, like, a year you've been taking, like, lessons or a year, you know, she said, no, I, I spent about the last year just teaching myself how to play the piano. I was at home. I had an interest. And um, in that 11 or so months, she came to a spot where she felt God tugging on her heart to get involved and serve, serve at our church. And I said, what, what made, you, made you get involved? And she answered with, um, this verse, it's Galatians chapter 1, uh, verse 10. It says, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. And then she said this, and this is a direct quote. She says, at some point, we need to step out of our comfort zone and be who, who God calls us to be. I'll say that again. At some point, we need to step out of our comfort zone and be who God calls us to be. So many of us may be sitting right here thinking, uh, what is God calling me to be? What is an area that I might be able to serve in and give through my time, give through my talent at this church? And I just, I can't help but think about the message last week where we thought about, imagine, imagine if we all served of our time, with our time, our talents, our treasures, the impact that this church could have, the huge impact that our church could have on our, 
our community, um, on our, 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 uh, our state, our country, the, the globally, the impact that we could have if we all answered that, that call like Mary did. Yeah, and a part of that, guys, I got a text message last night from Pastor Chris Harrison. He's our, he's our resident pastor in Houston, a good buddy of mine, and he just was checking in with us. Wanted to know how we were doing, how God was moving here, and wanted to continue to encourage us. And, and so because as a church, we take very serious our call as Christians in the face of calamity. We are sending work crews out there. We've got another crew getting ready to go here in the next week, I believe. Uh, two weeks that are going to go out there and do some work on the Hope House. And I know we're already working on a brand new uh, trip in the next quarter, probably, where there's going to be... Uh, maybe the largest group yet to go out there. So if you're interested in getting involved and want to know more about how you can be the hands and feet to go and to use your your, your giving to, to realize that, I would encourage you to see Lisa Wheeler all the way to my left, your right, and she would love to work with you to coordinate those schedules as well. But it's just another example of people who are stepping up and giving up their time, their treasures, and their talents and going out to make a difference. Who else would love to share how they're seeing God realizing our, our existence? Shanna. I can go ahead and share. I'm Shannon, and I am a part of the Connections team here at Country Bible, <clears throat> and I think that I get to have one of the best jobs here. I know that the others won't agree. Oh, Lisa doesn't agree, but um, I think that for us on the Connections team, it has just been a pleasure for us because we get to walk alongside uh, people as we are building relationships with them, and they are coming to us and saying, I want to get involved, I want to get connected, but I don't really know what I'd be good at or what I should do. And so we get to start that those conversations with them of talking about, well, what do you like to do? What are you passionate about? What kinds of things has God gifted you with? And what are the things that get you excited to, to serve others and to be involved? And as we do that, it's so fun to see the light bulb go on for them sometimes of, that's what it is. That's what God has for me. That's what I'd be good at. And then we get to just walk alongside and share that with them. And it's just a really exciting and really fun uh, ministry to be a part of. And I was thinking about our greeter ministry. <clears throat> and in August, we had, excuse me, <clears throat> we had a kickoff where we got all of the greeters together. <clears throat> we had probably about 60 people that came to that. We were just blown away with the, the uh, people that came out to just hear about what was going on in the greeting ministry and people that were willing to sign up and take spots and just get involved. And it has been really fun to see that. And I was thinking about a specific um, friend that has gotten involved with greeting, and he came to me one Sunday, and he, he came to this church, and he encountered Jesus, and his life is being changed. And it's been really fun to see and really fun to walk alongside of him. And he said, I need to greet. I need to get to know people. I don't know people's names. I don't know them, and I need to know them. And so I said, okay, um, how, what service do you want to help at, and how often do you think you'd want to do it? And his answer to me just gave me a chuckle and gave me such joy. He said, um, every service, every Sunday? And I said, <laughs> and I said, I kind of laughed and he said, no, every single service, every single Sunday. And so I said, we will take you as anytime, as often as you want. We would love it. And he has, he's been faithful when he's available and he is here, he is greeting and he is using his talents and making people feel welcome. And we could not be more excited. And so I think for, for us on the Connections team, it's just a lot of fun to get to share what God is doing in people's lives. That's awesome. I was thinking this morning as I was getting ready that uh, next Sunday, Pastor, is the one-year anniversary of when I preached my very first sermon here at our church. And I'm excited, yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited about a lot of the really cool things God is doing in our church. And you're gonna hear more really cool stories in a minute. But maybe one of the things as I enter my 21st year of ministry that is most exciting for me is to hear stories of how this church in its 47 years of existence has never had more commitment as a family or more volunteers from the people than it has the last 11 months. And that's because of you stepping up and taking ownership for our church, for your church, that at my church, we gather, we grow, we give, and we go. And I'm serious about that. So let me ask the question that I know everybody wants to know. How can I get involved if I'm not already involved right now 
how can I get connected? And I want you to share two things. Number one, what is the Connections Ministry all about? The three things that you're committed to. And number two, how can my friends here get to, get to, to, to know more about how to get involved? Okay. Well, the Connections Ministry, we, we are here to help people connect to God, to connect to other people, and to connect to the church in those three ways. And there's a few different ways you can do that. The cards that are in the backs of the chairs are a great way. You can just fill one of those out, drop it in the buckets, or hand it to someone as you're leaving. And someone from the Connections team will get with you, and we'll talk. We can begin those conversations about what you're passionate about and what you'd like to do how you'd like to get connected. Um, you can also go online. You can fill out those cards um, with the online version. You just go to the website and go to Get Connected, and those actual cards are online, so you can do it digitally if you'd rather. And um, also, you, we have a connection center right outside these doors to the right, and there's we have a great leadership team that we're putting together that we're really excited about. And so someone will be there manning that. We will be there. Um, you can connect with any one of those uh, people there at the connection center. They can help you. And you can always just call the office, too, and just say, I want to talk to somebody in the connections team, and they'll get you with someone who can get you connected. Awesome, Shannon. Thank you. I, I am excited. Shannon and her co-partner, uh, Jeannie, get to, to serve in that way, and, and we really are committed to helping everybody here get connected. Uh, Lisa, where are you seeing our identity realized as a, as a community and our core four being lived out? Well, I'm Lisa Wheeler, and I am the Director of Student Ministries, and I would like to share with you about the best ministry here um, at CBC. <laughs> Um, I'm blessed to get to lead this with my dear friend, Alicia Lorenz, and we have, talking about volunteers, we have 16 faithful um, adults who come and, and serve with us, and we couldn't do this ministry without them. Um, I think we're unique in that um, we kind of mimic big church, so everything that happens, we kind of get to do on um, our youth ministry, and so we, we gather on Wednesdays, um, that's exciting in that we're seeing a steady number, about 110 to 120. And if you know anything about high school students especially, they're busy. So it, it's a fluctuation of, of the consistency of who's coming, which means there's new people coming because that number hasn't changed. So every week, Alicia and I sit and, and look at these new names of kids that I don't know. And to me, that just is, is great joy. They're bringing their friends to gather and hear the word of God. And... Um, you know, exciting, the, the growing part. They, we have the Bibles back there, and our students use them faithfully on Wednesdays too. And, and it's so special to us to see 6th um, through 12th graders learning what their faith is. It's no longer their parents' faith, but it's theirs. They're starting to own it. They, they want to open the Bible. They want, they're opening the pages sometimes for the first time. They're taking Bibles home, some of them for their first Bible that isn't a little kid Bible or just a first Bible in general. That's super exciting. Um, our students are very giving. Uh, they, they help at Awana faithfully, a, a big number of them. And I, I know that the Awana ministry couldn't happen without those students being dedicated to our little people in the church. And, and you know, the great thing about being an Awana helper is you get to, you know, learn the verses yourself and hide them in your heart. So that, that's exciting. Um, but if you know me at all, the, the go aspect is what excites me best about our church. And as the leader of um, the mission trips for the last several years, I'm thrilled every year when I get the applications and I get to solidify that team. And this year's no different. Um, we actually had too many applications, which, you know me, broke my heart because not everybody will get to go. But again, I'm solidifying a team of 25 who are stepping out in faith to go to Nicaragua next fall, or next summer, I'm sorry, to, to share the gospel with, with people. They're going to the ends of the earth. And um, these are kids, guys. It's just thrilling to me. Um, but when I was asked this question in a specific story, I couldn't help but think of, um, I had a couple students right before school started came to me and, and told me they wanted to start a student-led ministry and they just needed a place to house it. And would I be willing to give of my space and my home? And I you know, was curious what, what they were thinking. And they described this ministry to me that they desired, um, that God had put on their heart to reach um, students in their school, not just their school in Blair, but the schools around, um, to, to reach students in other churches that maybe don't have a youth group, but just to be a place where students can come together. And, and what's unique about them is they come together and they lift each other up. Um, they ask each other, what are your highs and your lows of the week? They spend time encouraging one another and then praying for one another. And honestly, God, my favorite part of this is um, they spend an hour in worship. 
And if you've ever had a student playing, you know, an instrument in your house, it's pretty cool once they get the song down. <laughs> But I'm blessed every Monday to have 25 to 30 students in my basement for an hour, an hour, solid hour, worshiping our Lord, just singing, belting it out. And it, it's amazing. Um, it has blessed my, the rest of my family that we get to hear it every week and just see them. Um, they're encouragers and inviters. And they are, it isn't me going into high school and asking people to come here on Wednesday nights or Sundays. It's these students. These are the students that are faithful on Wednesdays, they're faithful on Sundays, and they're faithful on Mondays. And they're taking it into their schools and inviting others. They're taking Pastor Andrew at his word and going, taking up the challenge. And that's exciting to me. There's two things with what Lisa's sharing that are, that are fundamental. We understand that our students take this go very serious. Uh, a year ago, I attended our first youth ministry gathering with me on staff, and we had right around 40 students. For her to say that we average every week between 110 and 120 students, to give you some perspective, this last week, every seat was filled in the middle, and we were spilling over onto the sides, and there's over 320 chairs in our worship center right now. We packed out the middle, and we began to spill over. That's phenomenal. That's the kind of growth where these students have said, at my church, I'm responsible, even in my own age and my own area, to go. The second thing is I know of at least two families, and I know there's more, but two families that now attend our church that didn't attend our church a year ago. But because their students came and their students encountered Jesus and their students' lives began to change, they went home and began sharing with their parents. And now two families in particular come every single Sunday. They initially started coming just to support their children. And if you ask him today, I had one man grab me in the hall last Sunday with tears in his eyes, started hugging me and said, because my son started coming to this church, I've given my life to Jesus, and we don't miss a Sunday. So that's, that's, that's the impact. When you live out a church committed to being a community where people encounter Jesus, their lives are changed forever, and giving and growing and going and gathering is tremendous. Pastor, share with us a little bit about how you're seeing this existence and core values realized. Well, I'm Glenn Hudson, and I'm the have the privilege of being the congregational care pastor here at Country Bible Church. Been a part of the church for 19 years, on staff for eight years, and it just amazes me to see what God has been doing over this last year uh, here at CBC. And uh, thinking back uh, about a year ago, our Stephen ministry was on life support. I mean, we had lost a lot of our Stephen ministers, we lost the leadership. We had Kirk Hutton and Scotty Hundall step forward and say, we will take on that responsibility, self-funded their own uh, training and everything. We We've got 10 uh, people being trained right now that will be um, commissioned in the first part of the year that will actually triple the size of our Stephen ministry. And uh, it's just an amazing thing, yes, to see what uh, God is doing there. But uh, the, the changed lives is what really is important. And Stephen ministry will play a huge part in that going forward. But uh, the story that I would like to share started several months ago and early one morning, uh, while it was still dark outside, my cell phone goes off, and uh, I answered the phone, and, and the voice on the other end obviously was clearly distraught and said, uh, uh, Pastor Glenn, can I come to your house right now and talk to you? And I said, well, absolutely. And he says, another thing, would, would you please stay on the phone with me until I get there? I said, yes, I will. And uh, the individual showed up at my house and, and sat in my living room and cried and prayed and shared with me of, of all the destructive things that was taking place in his life that he felt was bringing his marriage to an end. And he felt like that if his marriage was ending, there was no reason for him to even really go on living. We talked and we prayed and I tried to convince him of, of God's love and mercy and forgiveness and that he just needed to uh, repent before God and repent to his wife and, and ask for forgiveness. And uh, he went from, as he started, started to leave my house, he paused at the door for a moment and began digging through his pockets. He says, one more thing. Finally, he pulls out a small object out of his pocket and lays it in my hand. And when I look at it, it's a bullet. <laughs> and then I knew why he wanted me to stay on the phone with him till he got to my house. He went from my house to Pastor Andrew's house while the kids were getting ready for school, shared his story with them. We spent the rest of that day with he and his wife uh, building a plan, developing uh, a plan of, of restoration, a plan of forgiveness, uh, a plan of rebuilding and restoring their relationship. You see, they had a fresh encounter with Jesus Christ, and it is changing their life forever. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Pastor, Pastor's right. That was an incredible story of... of 
a, a modern day miracle where all the statistics would show that this family was doomed and that this life was over, as was testified right here. Um, I got to meet with this, with this couple, and we, we continue to meet with them and journey with them. And, and today, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't, even, you wouldn't even know. Uh, they, are, they are pillars in our church and committed to seeing others' lives encountering Jesus and changed. And this individual uh, asked us to hold on to the bullet, and we kept it in my office. You remember that? We put the, it was a 40 caliber bullet. We kept it right on my shelf. And this individual said, hey, listen, one day I'm going to come back. I'm going to grab that, and it's going to be a testimony of how God saved my life. And we were there when he came back for his bullet, and his family is restored today because of Jesus alive in this church. And, uh, and so just tremendous. And there's more stories that you'll hear even like that today as we go on. But who else would like to, to share how they're seeing this realized here at our church? Hello, I'm Justin Ingot. I, uh, I'm kind of fortunate. I get to be involved in a lot of the aspects of ministry around here. I sing on the worship team. I help out with the youth. We sing at the youth. So... I guess my example is just, in general, the church. I've seen it. I've been coming here for quite a while, and it's, it was great. That's why we started coming here. And it really got put into words last week when Andrew said, we want to be a, mon a movement, not a monument. And I've heard that before. I've heard it as some clever words, but I've been seeing it, guys. If you don't know, I, I look out and I see every one of you guys right here right now, and it, it, the ability that you guys have just to go out and talk to people, just to go out and love on people, and to be a part of the community, we're growing, not necessarily just numbers-wise, but just in our spirituality, in our faith, we're growing in all of that. Um, so to, when he put words to, to be a movement and not a monument, that's, that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing the hands and feet come together and reach out into that community. Like this giant building is getting up and it's, we're reaching out. Let's pull some people into Jesus. Um, so that's just kind of one of the one of the big things that I've seen. I've I've got tons of examples, but I kind of wanted to just limit it to that. Again, I get I get to be a part of all the ministries. I, I'm not gonna say which one is best, but <laughs> awesome. But uh, what I will say is, right now, you guys have an opportunity to get involved in something and find out what suits you and find out what is going to be best for you. Let's be a part of this movement. Let's be the hands and feet that reach out. You know, one of the things that's, that's unique about all of our team, our staff, and our leadership, our family here, is we all have several things in common. And one of those things is that we make ourselves available. And Justin is a living embodiment of what it means to make yourself available. Uh, a story that has come out recently in our church uh, of making ourselves available is that we were in a, in a pastor's meeting, uh, Mark and, and myself and Alex, and we were having a conversation about kind of what we're doing in here, hearing Alex's vision and uh, Alex convincing Mark what it was going to take to fund it and me sitting between the two and, uh, and, and processing. And, and Brooke Boswell, who's my ministry assistant, came to my door. And Brooke, Brooke is really sensitive when I'm meeting with people. Uh, she's really great. I don't do what I do without Brooke Boswell uh, and, and the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. But she opened my door and she said, guys, I would never do this. But I just want to let you know, I, I, the Lord is, I, I just can't let this go. An individual just left our, our office and, and is heading out to their vehicle. Uh, and I really think somebody needs to go talk to him. Mark, so I'll do it. So not knowing the backstory, not knowing the circumstances, Mark jumps out, runs out to the parking lot to grab this person before they leave. And Alex and I continue to talk, and then we move from my office into here, and Alex begins to share his vision. And some 20 minutes later, Mark comes back. He says, hey, Pastor Andrew, can, can you come to my office? And I said, sure, bud. We walk in there, and, and he didn't have enough time from here to his office to preface what was going on. But I walked in, and what we encountered was an individual who told me verbatim, I was on my way, I was driving on my way, thinking about what options uh, I was going to take advantage of to kill myself. Not if I was going to kill myself, but how I was going to do it. And I drove past this church, and I felt compelled to pull in, and I was sitting there, and then Mark came and grabbed me, and we sat there and talked to this individual, and he said, I'll tell you what, I, I've heard this Christian spiel before, but I don't want to be a poser. His exact words were, I don't want to be a fake, I don't want to be a poser, I don't want to be a phony. And right there, we processed, had a really hard conversation, and he bowed his heart and bent his knee to Jesus. Another story of absolute life change, and then stepped into our, 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 our pastor, uh, Glenn's office, to get counseled and cared for, and now we're seeing relationships restored there. We're seeing this individual who just came to faith a few months ago is involved actively all the time in the life of the ministry of our church. And these are the things that we can't quantify with numbers, but we're realizing and all that we did in that moment, it wasn't anything, it was supernatural, but it wasn't anything special. We just made ourselves available. And, and that, that goes to show the power of being available. 
What else? Who else has a story? I'll jump in. Um, you know, as I listen to all the stories here, I just, you keep hearing the same terms, family, community, family, community. And what really has jumped out at me just listening today is we, we have so many ministries, those you're hearing from here today, um, the ministries that you're not hearing about, there's so much going on. Um, but it, as we grow as a church, it's easy for those ministries to become silos where we have people and individuals focused on doing one thing um, in all sorts of different areas. And over the past year, it's really felt and I've seen that we, we are a family. Um, those walls of ministries, uh, everyone's there to help everyone. It, it's about our family, it's about our church, it's about our community. And it's, it's really cool to see, you know, it's, um, there is no most important ministry, they're all important. <laughs> Love you, Lisa. <laughs> but but it's cool, you know. And and when I think about the the miracles, um, I, I always look for the miracles. But I we've been coming to CBC, my wife and I and our family for thirteen. I can't keep track. I can't think anymore. Um, but we grew up in this church, hearing the story. We started coming to CBC because of our children, because of the youth ministry, <clears throat> and got involved in those and. Um, became passionate about the Lord um, and was baptized in this church. You know, the, the amazing things that have happened over the years, but what I've really loved seeing in the past year is those that are coming back. Um, for whatever reason, we've had people that have left Country Bible over the years, and seeing those people back, back with a passion, um, back as part of the family, is just really, really cool. One of the things that you can't see from where you're at that I do is that both of his arms are absolutely full of goosebumps uh, because he, Kerry has been a part of our leadership team for quite a while and he has been through it all. Uh, these men like Ron Livermore and others who have been a part of our leadership team through the worst of times and the best of times are seeing a regeneration and it's incredible. Things that they never thought were possible or dreamed of that we're all getting to be a part of and witness what God is doing that is so much fun to be a part of. And so I just want to take a minute again to, to recognize the faithful volunteers, but specifically the spiritual leaders of our church, these men and their families that are in the trenches, these elders that, that uh, they go to bat for us every single day to advance the kingdom's cause and to realize our existence here. So thank you, Carrie and Ron, and to the rest of our leadership team as well. Caitlin, talk to us a little bit about the kids' ministry and where you're seeing our identity realized and our core four lived out. Um, I think a place that I'm seeing our core four and our identity um, really shown is through our volunteer leadership team. Um, we have so many volunteers that come every single week um, that just want to love on kiddos and make sure that um, they have a deeper understanding of God's word. And um, one of those people... Um, that's been really faithful to do that is Emily McBride. Um, she has gotten really involved in kids ministry um, over the last six months or so. Um, she's leading our kids worship every other week and the kids absolutely love her. So she's giving of her time and her talents to do that. Um, she loves to just gather with the kids to um, get to know them better, to help them grow as she's learning alongside of them. Um, and she just um, has a passion for teaching kids and for loving on kids. Um, so she's gotten involved in kids' worship in Awana, and she's on our Christmas program leadership team. Um, so she's just, she's all in, and um, we just are so thankful for all our volunteers that we have. So. Yeah, and Caitlin knows all too well uh, what they're seeing realized in their, in their children's ministry. A year ago, you guys had, what, 25 to 30 students on a Sunday. And now you guys are somewhere between, anywhere between 80 and 130 every single week. And so we're seeing the, the student ministries not only increase, but the children's ministries. And that's made possible because of you. Because of volunteers like you who said, you know, I'm not great with, with, uh, with mowing lawns. My wife doesn't let me around yard tools. Uh, I'm not great with preaching and teaching. I'm not a musician. But I tell you what, I'm really goofy and fun and love kids, and I'm, I'm all in. I'm all in. And not that you have to be goofy to be with kids. I, I mean, it just that's my experience. I'm goofy, and I have lots of kids. 
but uh, we're seeing we're seeing our 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 children. And and for me, I have I still have I have six kids, five who are still in the house, and they all have friends in the neighborhood. And so our house becomes a a a, a, a melting pot of kids from our community. And I love to see them exchange stories about what God is doing. And maybe they're doing it because it's the pastor's house, but they're in my refrigerator eating my food as they're doing it. So I don't know. <laughs> but they're, cha- they're exchanging stories about what's going on and what they're learning and the songs they're learning and all that. And so thank you to you guys who make our children's ministry possible and make their life. For the first time, maybe ever, but in a very long time, the, the children's ministry has not had to scramble to schedule people last minute because they have enough volunteers. They still want plenty more. They want more. They want plenty more. Don't get me wrong, but it's been amazing. Ron, Ron Livermore, I'd love to hear how you are seeing our existence realized and, and our core four come to fruition. Well, first of all, I, I think Andrew just put me here in the middle to fill a seat because it was, was, was an empty seat here. But no, uh, I guess through all this, I've... Uh, I started coming to CBC, uh, I think, in 1979. And, of course, I was drugged here by my wife. I didn't want to be here. But uh, she has a way of uh, convincing me of things. And, anyway, we started coming, and we've been coming uh, ever since. But I guess I'm, uh, what I've been seeing and how all this fits in, uh, if I ramble a little bit, just bear with me. But I kind of want to speak to the fathers uh, in the crowd and whenever I talk about crowd, or excuse me, families, uh, their fathers, mothers, and then their kids, I get a little choked up. But when uh, I was first coming here and they asked me, uh, well, it was a few years after that, to be a deacon, I said, well, I don't think I'm qualified, but if you need some help, I'll do it. And as the years go by, they say, well, would you consider being an elder? And I said, well, I don't think I'm qualified, but thought about, prayed about it, got some counsel, and they said, uh, you know, that, that maybe we should try that. So I did. I guess what I'm saying through that is it's nothing about me is through that, your kids and grandkids are going to get involved in something, whether it's sports, whether it's other good things or some bad things, whatever it might be. But I'm, I'm just hoping that and thinking that through when I made that decision to, to volunteer, that that had some effect on my family. And what else would you rather have your kids uh, involved in? Since that time, I, I've, got, uh, I've got two sons, and one of them has been involved in the church for a long time, went on many mission trips. Uh, this is the last one he went on to. He's a, he helps with the IT around here. He's out here building stuff. He's here all the time. My other son has been on... Uh, several mission trips. My wife is involved in mops, and this is not a bragging thing, believe me, it's just hoping that if you would get involved, what your sons and daughters would, would see uh, of getting, in, in getting involved and in helping out. And, and sitting beside me is my daughter-in-law, and you know uh, what she does. Uh, Caitlin's my granddaughter. She's involved, works here. And what... Um, what that, uh, here's the tough part. <clears throat> what that has done for me personally and all the things that they have done and all the friends that have, that have, that have volunteered. I guess I'm saying your kids look up to you. That's right. And when they get involved, uh, what, what a blessing. And they talk about the troubles we've been through and the elders and all this stuff. None of that stuff compares to the blessings that they have brought me to see them <clears throat> be here and do what they're doing. Yeah. And I know your kids and, and family can do the same thing. So I just, it's just a, I guess it's a, it's, I guess I'm rattling about myself a lot, but it's not that. It's what they, what they've done to the, for the church, and I'm how proud I am of them, and all these people up here have been here for. 35 years, and as Andrew said, the volunteers are just coming out of the woodwork. But see, they're the ones that's getting the blessings. So I just, that's, that's what I see, and, and just thank you for listening to me ramble. Yeah. Hey, that's awesome. 
two really important things uh, that came out of that. Number one, you started coming in 1979. I was born in 78. Just, just, uh, just, just, just put that in your lap. Uh, but the second thing that, that, that really I hope you heard in what Ron just shared, which is uh, that we're a family. And as is the case with every family, there's a legacy. There's a legacy. I'm a father of six. And I'm very aware of my legacy and my family. And we're very intentional about how we live our lives and raise our children because of that legacy. We are a family. You're my brothers and sisters in Christ. And we need to be very aware about our legacy of being a community where people encounter Jesus and their lives are changed forever and where we are committed to gathering, giving, growing, and going. You know, last week I asked you to think about it. I said, imagine. Imagine if we took God at his word. Imagine if we really gathered as a community, if we, if we really gathered to encourage one another and to exalt the name of Jesus collectively and to equip the believers so that we could become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Imagine if we were to grow, to take growing in our faith serious, to take growing in our relationships with God and one another to a whole new level. Imagine if we were to be known for our radical generosity and how we give. And imagine if we were a church that would go, that we would go into the marginalized, the mistreated, the misrepresented, and the misplaced. Imagine if we were a community that cared more about being a movement of God than building monuments for the godly. And these are the stories. Church, I have been excited to share some of the numbers because numbers can tell a part of the story. If you use numbers, they act as a barometer to kind of gauge where you're at. And so when I say things like, in 11 months, we've seen 135 people that we know of, that we have exchanged handshakes with, or that we have prayed with individually. 135 people bow their heart and bend their knee to Jesus in our family. We know that. We know that 21 people have gone public with their faith, declaring for everybody that I am a follower of Jesus. And I know that in a few weeks, we've got, what, 12 more people lined up to be baptized? And we want you to get baptized as well. If you've not been baptized and gone public with your faith, please let us know. We'd love to have you be a part of that family experience. We have got more. We've given out over 450 Bibles. It's close to 500 Bibles that we've given out now over the last 11 months. And these are amazing things. But none of those numbers scratch the surface for the testimonies and the experience that we get to be a part of as a church. And it's imperative that we share that with you so that you know why we do what we do. Because of who we are and whose we are. And my invitation to you this morning as we wrap up is to consider not if, but where. Not if you should be involved, or if you, if you should come and gather, or if you should grow, or if you should give, or if you should go. Not if, if we have enough time, or if we have enough talent, or if we have not enough treasure, if we have enough experience, or enough qualifications, or if it's convenient. But to recognize that we are a part of something eternal, that we are a part of a family, something much bigger than ourselves. And when we come together, unified around a common mission to love God with every fiber in our being and love our neighbors as ourselves, to come around a common vision of making disciples of all nations and raising up fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, and then to come around a common identity where at our church we exist to be a community where people encounter Jesus and their lives are changed forever. I believe with all of my heart that you and I together as a family will experience a revival of epic proportions across our community and far beyond. So I want to thank you for those of you who make our ministry possible and help us realize these things, and I want to invite everyone to the table. There's room at the table. I want to invite you to come and get involved. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these amazing testimonies, the living embodiment of your word becoming active and alive in our lives. Jesus, we love you, and we offer these stories of life change up to you as an offering and a sacrifice, because you are God worthy of praise. Father, I pray that as we celebrate these stories that we wouldn't get stuck in, in, a, in a mountaintop experience, but that we would get prepared 
to go into the valley and to do what you've called us to do, which is to be a community where people encounter Jesus and lives are changed forever. Father, we pray that you be glorified in everything that we say and in everything that we do. And Lord, as we're faithful stewards of what you've given us, we ask that you would give us the harvest. For your name's sake, Jesus, we pray. Amen. I love you. I love doing this life and ministry with you. And I want to implore you to go this week and to live a life representative of someone who's encountered Jesus and their life has been changed forever. And grab those black cards, power of one, bring somebody back with you. Next week, you're dismissed.